In the last video, we motivated the need for an alternative method to solving problems for which we can't solve the Schrodinger equation explicitly and we can't use perturbation theory. We ended on a result that's sometimes known as the variational principle that says that the true ground state energy of a system is guaranteed to be less than or equal to uh, this ratio over here, regardless of this function psi. And what that means is even though we don't know the true solution to the Schrodinger equation, if we just guess uh, some function psi, our uh, estimated for the energy will always be greater than or equal to the true ground state energy. So we can place an upper bound on the ground state energy of a system. Uh, in this video, we're going to show why this is true uh, by using uh, a trial function. So I guess to the psi. So this is a, a proof. So the idea is we don't know what psi actually is, the true psi that solves the Schrodinger equation for this Hamiltonian. We're instead going to guess a different wave function based on physical considerations of what we know about the system and in a way that it captures the expected properties of the wave function. And usually to, uh, to be able to guess a correct or a close to correct wave function, we take into consideration, uh, we use physical considerations about the system. So whether there is symmetry, uh, whether uh, we expect any nodes in the wave function, et cetera. So uh, we guess a new wave function such that this ratio, and notice it doesn't have to be a normalized wave function because we have this term over here that will normalize the solution for us. And this we'll call uh, E tilde. So this is the, uh, the energy or the expectation value of the Hamiltonian for this uh, trial wave function, okay? It, alternatively, it's just the estimated energy of this Hamiltonian given this wave function, or rather the estimated energy of this state described by this wave function. And what we wanna show is that this energy is always greater than or equal to the true ground state energy. This is the true ground state energy of the system. The equality over here is satisfied if we happen to guess exactly the correct wave function of the system. Otherwise, it will always serve as, a, as an upper bound to the ground state energy. All right, so the idea behind the proof is even though we don't know the solution, we know that the set of solutions to the Schrodinger equation form an orthonormal uh, basis set. And we'll denote this by ket i 
uh, cat psi i. Okay, so this is the set of solutions to the Schrodinger equation for a given complicated Hamiltonian. And these form an orthonormal basis set. What that means is that we can express our uh, we can express any arbitrary but physically reasonable uh, wave function. By physically reasonable, I mean that it has to satisfy continuity and uh, the same boundary conditions that the actual wave function is subject to. We can express any arbitrary wave function as a linear combination of these psi i's, okay? And it's important to keep in mind that we don't actually know what these are, but this result is true regardless of what they are. So what this means is we can express a trial function in terms of a linear combination of these unknown solutions. And here we're going to take the ground state to start at an index i is equal to one. And we can say that there are lowercase n solutions. And here as usual, n can tend to infinity. You can have infinitely many solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Plugging this back into our result over here. So plug in into here. The uh, remember when we transform from a ket to a bra, uh, the operation that connects those two. Uh, quantities is a Hermitian conjugate. So that means that our linear combination over here changes to bra psi and the coefficient now becomes its complex conjugate. The Hamiltonian operator remains the same. And here we're going to use a different index for the summation because there's a different sum from over here. And this one, uh, this is just expressing the cat phi as a linear combination of these wave functions. Likewise, over here, we'll have a double sum, uh, complex conjugate psi i from the bra, uh, cj from the cat over here, and the inner product of two wave functions of so psi i and psi j. Now, because we know that whatever these wave functions are, they have to be orthonormal to one another, their inner product is necessarily equal to the Kronecker delta. So this is one when i is equal to j and zero when i is different than j. Uh, so that will collapse this sum over here. So at the top in the numerator, let's write that out first. in the denominator. We can replace this inner product by the Kronecker delta. There's two sums here over i and j. And this Kronecker delta will collapse one of the sums. So this is only non-zero when i is equal to j. So the only term that survives in the second term sum is when cj is equal to ci.
And what that means is you'll have CI complex conjugated times CI. So this is just the sum of the square modulus of CI in the denominator. For the numerator, we know that Psi J is the solution to the Schrodinger equation. So we can replace this by the energy of the jth uh, energy level. That's the wave function of Psi J. And this is an eigenvalue equation. This is just the Schrodinger equation. So rewriting that over here. We have this. By the Schrodinger equation, we know that this has to be true because we assume that these functions uh, satisfy the Schrodinger equation. And then because E, this is EJ, because EJ is just a number, it can be taken out of the brackets. And we have again, this inner product between our wave functions. Again, these are guaranteed to be orthonormal, whatever they may be. So this is just, the Kronecker delta, it will collapse the J sum because only the term CJ when CJ is equal to CI and EJ equal to EI will survive. This is where ground state starts at the index I1. Okay, so we're left with this. So this was this was this uh, ratio that we started with, and we said that this was equal to uh, some energy e tilde. And our claim was that this e tilde is always greater than or equal to the ground state energy of our system. So this is new notation. I've replaced the EGS by E1 because we said our ground state starts at U1. Oh, so this is true ground state energy. Okay, so how does this help us? We have E tilde is equal to this complicated ratio. So another way of writing this and saying E tilde minus E1 has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we're going to subtract an E1 from this. We want to put this in a common denominator. So we bring, we multiply, we bring this up here, or we multiply top and bottom over here by sum of the CI squares. This is E1. The sum of CI uh, squares is common to both of them. So we can factor that out. And we 
we end up with this result. And because E1 is the true ground state energy of our system, EIs are uh, the true energies of our system. So we know that EI has to be greater than or equal to E1. Okay, so these are the true energies of the system described by the Hamiltonian. So we have that this E1 is actually equal to the true ground state energy. The first excited state is greater than the true ground state energy and so on. The denominator is always positive. Uh, so this doesn't affect anything. And because all of the excited state energies are guaranteed to be greater than the true ground state energy, this is necessarily greater to or equal than zero. It's only equal when uh, we're looking at the ground state, it's greater than when we're looking at any excited state. So we've proved this inequality here, which is the same thing as proving our variational principle that we started with. So uh, this is a very powerful technique and it's widely used in chemistry to calculate uh, energies of complicated molecules. And it's relatively easy to use. The idea is you can guess some trial wave function and uh, uh, phi, which we're done wrong by phi, and calculate this ratio. And if, depending on how good our guess is, this uh, estimated energy will give us an upper bound to the true ground state energy of the system. In the next video, we'll go through some of the practicalities of actually choosing a trial wave function that will get us close to, uh, as close as possible to the true ground state energy of the system. It's not, it's not a blind guess, it's more of an educated guess based on the properties of the system. And in the next video, we'll show some tips and tricks of uh, how that's done in practice.